Welcome to B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher, along with B News Director Rich Hosford, B News reporters Tad Stefanak and Robert Paris, John Vias with the weather, Gretchen Carey with the community calendar, and Liz Gillespie with sports. Thank you for joining us. The town of Burlington is in the process of applying for emergency funding to clean the Mill Pond Reservoir drinking water of per polyfluoroalkyl substances. Say that three times fast. As reported by B News, as the result of a new state drinking water standard, the town of Burlington completed testing for this family of chemical compounds. The results indicate the presence of PFAS in a concentration of 40 parts per trillion, that's trillion, above the new standard of 20 parts per trillion. During a special meeting of the Board of Health on Tuesday night, town officials discussed the plans to mitigate the issue. DPW Director John Sanchez said the first step was to reduce the amount of water taking from the fine brick wells and open the connection to the MWRA through Lexington. The next step will be to install new filters at the Mill Pond Water Treatment Plant to remove PFAS. To help finance the project, Sanchez said the town has applied for financing from a state revolving fund. Typically this is done in October, but during emergencies, cities and towns can seek out the low interest financing, normally 2% interest, through a special request. This is what Burlington has done, and Sanchez said the town was given the go-ahead to apply to cover the cost of the filters and the engineering to draw up the plans. In total, the town is applying for $8 million, a figure Sanchez said is an estimate, but is based on costs other town have incurred for similar projects. Sanchez said the town will also apply for grant funds from the American Recovery Act to help pay for the engineering costs. Director Sanchez said the original plan was to bring this to town meeting in September for approval and start construction next spring with the goal of completing the project by the end of 2022. However, he said that because of dozens of municipalities have their PFAS levels come in above this new standard, there's been a rush on filters. He explained there are reports that towns are facing a 20-month delay from the time they order the special filters to the time of delivery. He said it may be possible to speed up this process and his department will be looking at every angle. Perhaps they could split the project and place the order before the engineering piece is complete or try other avenues. The town of Burlington is taking steps to prevent the municipality from being impacted by hackers and ransomware. Last week, the Board of Selectmen voted to adopt the Town of Burlington's cybersecurity policy by a unanimous vote. The policy was written by the Burlington Information System Security Advisory Committee. The committee expressed the need for greater protection of the town's information and computer systems. They pointed to the recent cases of hackers using ransomware to attack municipal systems and pipelines and beef manufacturers or beef processors where they either demanded a ransom to have it unlocked or stole it for other purposes. They said an attack should be considered a matter of when and not if, and preparations are necessary now. The policy outlines a number of steps that department heads can take and sets up a task group that will provide guidance on all prevention and preparedness measures the town will undertake. Some of these measures include training for all in town employees and best practices for cybersecurity, adopting industry-accepted standards to prevent cyber attacks, complete a town-wide risk analysis, develop attack response and recovery plans, and conduct periodic drills to measure the town's overall performance. Members of the board said they were in favor of the policy and thanked all the members of the ISAC committee who worked on putting it together. Here is board vice chair Nick Priest on the need for such a policy. This is, you know, the way we need to think about this is this is a new piece of infrastructure. Um, you know, much like we have stop signs and, uh, you know, uh, stop lights and paint on the road and, you know, all of the infrastructure made for people, people driving their cars, so that leads all the way to the police, right? Shouldn't something be escalated at that point? Same thing, right? This is, this is meant to be preventative at first and then escalate all the way to dealing with an actual attack. Um, you know, and I think like everyone said thus far, um, it's a must. In, in, in my mind, there's there's no way around this. We are not, I mean, and, and this is no disparagement, <laughs> disparagement to smaller towns, but we are not a small community with a small budget. Um, we are a large community with a large budget, and it's going to continue to grow, making us an ever more present target to people who want to prey on us. Um, and so to not be prepared 
at all, in my mind, is a complete miss. People who work in Burlington are encouraged to sign up for the town's code red emergency alerts so they can get pertinent information in a timely manner. B News Director Rich Hosford went to speak to the Burlington Police about the program and has this report. The recent boil water order that was issued from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection after Burlington's drinking water tested positive for E. coli shows how important getting accurate information in a timely manner during an emergency can be. One way residents can stay informed is through the town's Code Red Alert System, which Burlington Police, Fire, and other departments can use to reach everyone who has signed up for the free service. So the system allows us to call everyone who's in our database. Uh, people have to sign up for it. We can't sign you up for it. You have to sign yourself up for it. And everyone who has done that would receive any emergency alerts. And these are the types of things that could be... Um, if we had a major traffic accident and we wanted people to avoid Cambridge Street, let's say, you know, at rush hour, if, if we have to shut down a whole portion of the town, if there's a chemical spill and uh, chemical leaking into a neighborhood, we would send an alert out for that. Uh, a bank robber uh, runs off into a neighborhood. We would be able to alert, uh, we can alert certain areas in town. We don't have to send that message to the entire town. It's for emergency alerts as well as uh, regular community alerts, such as uh, things like, hey, garbage day is, has changed one day or whatever. Code Red can be a valuable tool, but residents must take the time to sign up and then keep their contact information up to date. Yeah, so the problem we've had over the years is getting people to sign up. Burlington has changed quite a bit. We have a lot of people moving in. Um, Burlington used to be a lot more long-term residents. Now, uh, with people moving constantly, people are getting rid of their landlines uh, often and, and relying on their cell phones. So we need people to actually sign themselves up for these systems because if they don't, uh, we're not going to be able to alert them for an emergency. So how do you sign up? So you can go to the town of Burlington's website uh, at burlington.org, and there's a link, and it's a very simple process. You hit the link and you'll have a screen. You put in your information. Code Red's really great because it allows you to say, I want to get a call at work. I want to get a call at home. I want to get a call on my cell phone and a text message and an email. Uh, it, it has all of those features. Uh, the system can pump out thousands of calls per minute and we're able to alert everyone in our contact list in a fairly short time. Finally, Lieutenant Mills also suggests residents follow the department's social media accounts. One thing you might want to do too is just follow us on social media because the fastest alert tool that I have is in my pocket on my cell phone. I can very quickly put something on Twitter. We have Twitter in our dispatch center that we monitor what's going on in town and we can send messages out very quickly. Code Red, it's sort of a harder process for us to put that message together, record the message, make sure it's correct, choose the uh, people we want to send it to. Um, that might take a few minutes, whereas with Twitter, it's as fast as you can type 280 uh, characters. From the Burlington Police Department, I'm B News Director Rich Hosford. The Board of Selectmen discussed a proposed flag raising policy for the town common, but did not come in come to any final conclusions during last week's meeting. A draft of the policy was presented by Selectman Nick Priest. It states the third party organizations or individuals could apply to have the town raise a particular flag on a town flagpole that would be in erect, in a, erected in a yet to be determined location on or near the common. In the policy, it is made clear that the Board of Selectmen has final say over whether a particular flag could be flown and that they could approve or deny an application for any reason or no reason at all. Selectman Priest said the policy was drafted because numerous groups and residents have asked to have their flags flown in recognition of different holidays, anniversaries, and important dates. While the Selectman agreed that they wanted something that residents could use to mark special occasions, there was some hesitancy about a flagpole. Selectman Mike Runyon and Joe Mirandi also said they were worried the town could face lawsuits if it turned down some flags while approving others, despite the language of the policy. Runyon suggested that since most activities on the common focus on the gazebo, the town could put brackets on the structure that could be fitted with flags during the time of an event. 
Priest said he was open to different ideas, including the gazebo, but said the board would still need to approve the policy so as to have control over what types of flags are displayed on town property. Board Chair Jim Tiggis said they would further discuss the policy at the next meeting and pointed out if there were unintended consequences, they would repeal it in the future. A new sandwich and salad shop that also offers breakfast choices has received the go-ahead to open in the Burlington Mall. The planning board approved a special permit application for Bennett Sandwich Shop to open in a storefront in the former Sears building in the mall. Bennett's is a small family-owned business that features a variety of hot and cold subs and sandwiches, breakfast bowls, sandwiches and salads. They will have a space between 1,200 and 1,400 square feet in the mall and offer both dining in and taking out. They will have 20 seats indoors and 20 seasonal outdoor seats on the patio. This will be Bennett's fourth location with others open in the Fenway area of Boston, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and a new location in Kennebunkport, Maine. Planning Director Kristen Kasner said she was happy to welcome a family-owned business into the Burlington Mall. The business is planning to open sometime in October of this year. Now that businesses have mostly, mostly fully opened and capacity limits are scrapped, people have mostly been stuck in their homes for over a year, are ready to get out and hit their favorite restaurants. There is one big issue, however. Many restaurants are struggling to find employees. Burlington Area Chamber of Commerce President Brick Parker said there's not a restaurant in town that isn't actively looking for a significant amount of help and that a lack of employees is the number one issue in the restaurant industry right now. Parker said there are numerous factors at play as to why restaurants are having a diff difficult time filling positions. He said during the economic shutdown caused by the pandemic, some employees chose to get out of the industry altogether. Others have been on unemployment for a long period of time and may be nervous to go back to interacting with the public while the pandemic is still a factor. Some people, especially with school just getting out for the summer, are hampered by childcare issues. Luke Beardsley, director of operations for Asterio Nino and a, couple of, and a handful of restaurants in Boston, said they had to lay off a lot of their staff during the shutdown and have since reached out to them to try and bring them back with mixed results. Beardsley added that people often chalk up the shortage to people getting additional unemployment benefits, but he think it's more complicated than that. He said restaurants can be thankless, restaurant work can be thankless, and it's a lot of hours, and people have figured out how to survive a year and a half without working in restaurants and not necessarily looking to jump back into it. Beardsley said the restaurant industry also employs a lot of migrant workers, and many of them have had to return to their home countries when they couldn't continue working in the U.S. during the shutdown. Both Parker and Beardsley said this is a good time for restaurant workers or people interested in joining the industry. Businesses are competing for employees and many are offering higher wages and bonuses for working a few months. It is also an industry that has much room to grow. In the latest Burlington History Uncovered, Burlington Historical Commission's Peter Capola uses his collection of garden shears to talk about the evolution of the tool from the time of the Roman Empire until today. I get through the winter by restoring um, hand tools, gardening, woodworking, and typically I spend the previous summer and spring and fall going anywhere, flea markets, stopping at houses, whatever, to, to look for items that I can restore during the winter. And what you see is a collection of garden shears that I've um, restored over this past year. These are interesting, these, these shears, because they tell a little bit about the evolution of, of gardening shears. For instance, these sheep shears are something that have been around for literally thousands of years. The Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, they all used these, and they were used and are still being used today. It's a very good, very good uh, tool for the garden. But somewhere around the uh, turn of the last century, some people started getting the feeling that this exercise, this use was not ergonomically correct. And ergonomics, by the way, is a word that, that came about in 1858. So that's a term that's been around for a while. So they felt that this was not the best way to be 
cutting grass and weeds all day. Instead, your hand should be more like this. So in 1919, a gentleman by the name of uh, Goodwin pulled out a patent that changed that motion, and he put a little U right here and a pivot point here so that when you squeeze the handles, the blades came together. Give you a better example here, you can see it better here. So what he did was he put the pivot point here and then he locked the blades here and he had these two pieces pulled down. And that's how the shear worked. Now what's good about these is that you can take them all apart to sharpen and restore them. For example, this and this are the same shear. So this is what all of these looked like prior to me getting started. One of the things that I noticed in the restoration is all the color. When I cleaned it all up, I could see the colors coming through and I tried to match the colors to the original. We always think about our ancestors, our grandparents, uh, living in a black and white world because back in the 40s and 50s, and there were no color uh, film, no videos and color movies were in black and white. So we never thought of them in anything but shades of gray. And here we are with all of these beautiful colors. And that just struck me as, as so interesting. If you get the opportunity, take the time to, to pick up something to keep you busy during the winter to get rid of that boredom. Burlington Relay for Life went online for the second year in a row due to the pandemic, but fortunately was more successful this time due to more time to plan and greater familiarity among organizers about how to host virtual events. The American Cancer Society's Relay for Life is usually an overnight event to raise funds for cancer research and to support patients and their families. Along with funding research, money goes to a variety of services for those afflicted with the disease. Burlington Relay for Life coordinator Nikki Pladzewicz said the goal of the organizers this year was to make the virtual event mirror the traditional relays as closely as possible, including with an opening ceremony. They had guest speakers, including a survivor, a caregiver, and a representative from Leahy Clinic. They also had fun events throughout the day, including a video from the title kickboxing participants uh, who could follow along with some, for some exercise. They ended the night with a video featuring the traditional luminaria bags, white bags with the names of cancer survivors or those who passed from the disease that are filled with lights to represent hope in the darkness. As of this writing, Burlington Relay uh, has raised $14,154 for the American Cancer Society and they will continue to collect donations through the month of July. We go now to John Vias, who's filling in for Peter Brown this week with the weather for the latest forecast. He'll also check out the community calendar uh, with Gretchen Carey to see what's happening in Burlington. We'll also have our latest social media minute with Gabrielle. Hello and welcome to this week's B News Weather. John V is here, filling in for Peter Brown. Let's jump right into that seven-day forecast, shall we? At the start of our cycle, we'll begin with a chance of thunderstorms on Friday with a high of 78 degrees. And as we enter the weekend, things really start to heat up with Saturday boasting a high of 86 degrees under partly sunny skies. And Sunday will also be mostly sunny and even warmer with a high near 89. And the heat just continues into the work week. Monday we'll see a chance of showers around noon, but we'll otherwise have mostly sunny skies with a high around 91 degrees. Tuesday we'll have more of the same with partly sunny conditions and a high of 90. On Wednesday we have a chance of showers, but they won't cool things down much as we'll still have a high near 88 degrees. And finally on Thursday, the first day of July, the temperatures will once again get above 90, with an expected high of 93. We are truly in the days of summer with this forecast. I'm John Vias, saying as Peter Brown always does, get out there, enjoy the weather, and have a great week. Hey friends, I'm Gabrielle, also known as Miss Burlington MA. 
I'm here to share with you my posts and pictures from my own social media account and showcase the amazing businesses and things to do in and around Burlington. A Burlington classic spot that has really made its mark within this past year is none other than Burlington Famous Pizza. Burlington Famous Pizza is owned by the most genuine Greek family with a serious passion for creating delicious and authentic meals. Their classic cheese pizza is fantastic, but I especially love their Greek style fries with crumbled feta. It is so good. Hey everyone, I'm Gretchen Carey and this is your community calendar. It's the biggest event of the evening. On Wednesday, June 30th at 6 p.m., BCAT will be having their annual meeting at the Burlington High School Cafeteria and Fogelberg Auditorium. Everyone is welcome and the event is free. For more information, go to bcattv.org. Come and enjoy some entertainment. Also on June 30th, the Burlington Parks and Recreation Department is having a children's performance featuring Johnny the K. The event will be held on the town common. Everyone is welcome and the event is free. Happy birthday, America! On July 4th, the Burlington 4th of July Committee will be having a rolling rally at 11 a.m. For more info, go to the Burlington 4th of July Committee. I'm Gretchen Carey and that was your community calendar. The spring sports season is all but over. We go now to B News for Sports reporter Liz Gillespie for all the latest action in this week's sports report. Hey everyone, I'm Liz Gillespie and this is your weekly sports report. Burlington High Spring Sports are headed to the MIAA State Tournament and we have some updates on how everyone did. Girls Tennis hosted the Beverly Panthers on Friday, June 18th in the North Division II MIAA Playoff Tournament at Rahanas Park. The Red Devils finished the match with a 3-2 win. Singles winners from the match were Casey Postizzi and Haley Doiron. First doubles winners were Annabelle Willie and Sam Matai. They then headed to Marblehead on Monday, June 21st to face the Magicians. The Magicians ended their season with a 2-3 decision. Winners in the meet were Casey Postizzi and yours truly. Their final record for the year was 11-3. Boys Tennis had a match against Wayland on Friday, June 18th at Rahanas Park in the North Division II MIAA playoffs. Burlington lost the match 5 to nothing. Their final record for the year was 9 and 4. Both outdoor track teams will be competing in the North Division II pentathlon and sectional performances at Weston High School on Friday, June 18th through Sunday the 20th. You can check out the full list of results on our B News Sports section at bcattv.org. Red Devils girls and boys lacrosse teams have closed out their seasons. For more on this, we go to B News Sports reporter Robert Ferris. Teams did very well during the regular seasons. Girls Across finished the year undefeated at 10-0 and were the 2021 Middlesex League Freedom Division champs. Pretty awesome. The girls worked so hard for that. Um, we have great leadership from our senior and junior class. Freshmen, just a great group. We have one sophomore, um, but they they really do. They, they, they keep us going, um, and we were so excited. 10-0, that's, that's amazing and they, they worked hard every single game. I know we didn't let any more than eight goals um, in, that, in the 10-0 record, and uh, we just we let it rip. So, Unfortunately, the team's journey came to an abrupt halt as they lost to Lowell in the first round of the MIAA playoffs. Yeah, that was a tough loss. Um, our girls put their heart and their soul into it. In the first half, it just wasn't falling our way. Ground balls, missed passes, um, but then second second half we started coming back where we tied it up 10 to 10 super proud of them we uh, said what we needed to in the huddle and they worked on it um, but we just didn't go our way today but you know what that just makes us hungrier for next year although the boys didn't go undefeated the Red Devils had a good season with a 9-4 record they went on to verse the Beverly Panthers in the first round of the MIAA tournament where they outscored their opponent 10 to 2. First of all, I wanted to congratulate uh, Beverly on a well, clean, hard fought game for four quarters. There was a lot of heat out here. They didn't quit, they didn't get uh, chippy. Um, I thought that both teams competed real cleanly. They did a really good job today, all around. Um, and again, uh, the coaching staff, they did a wonderful job. It's, uh, they make it so that I can come out here and talk because they do so much good work. Kyle Blanchett, uh, Ryan Doherty, and Brendan Murphy. The team advanced to the second round where they faced the Reading Rockets. Burlington ended up getting stopped by Reading with a 10-5 defeat. As both teams head into the offseason, 
they were grateful to get the opportunity to play on varsity field during the modified spring season. Just seeing them all together. This was really, this is my fourth year doing this. I've loved all of the girls that I've coached, but there was something special about this season and, and this group of girls particularly. They all just got along so well. Um, we lift each other up when they were down. It, it was just, it was all, it was just very natural. Um, all the friendships um, from Coach Joyce and I, we are going to miss them all, those seniors. But we can't wait to see everybody else coming back next spring. From Burlington High School, I'm Robert Paris for B News Sports. Red Devil Baseball headed to Greater Lowell Tech on Friday, June 18th for the North Division II MIAA Playoff Tournament. Burlington had a tough time scoring and only garnered two runs. Greater Lowell went around the diamond five times. The final in the game was 5-2. to two. The Red Devils ended their season with a 3-10 record, and that includes playoffs. Girls softball hosted the Melrose Red Raiders on Monday, June 21st at Marvin Field in the North Division II MIAA playoffs. Let's go to the highlights. It was a humid day for the girls softball team as they faced off against the Melrose Red Raiders. Let's get to see what was an exciting matchup. During the first inning, Merrill's got on the board 1-0. The Red Devils were unsuccessful as they could not score in the bottom of the first. As the bottom of the second rolled around, the score was still 1-0. That all changed when Burlington took the lead over Melrose 2-1. By the top of the fourth inning, the Red Raiders scored three runs and got back the lead 3-2. Burlington's junior, Sophia Wozczek, tied it for the Devils 3-3 in the bottom of the fourth. The top of the seventh went to Melrose as they ran around the diamond twice, taking the lead again 5-3. Bottom of the seventh was critical for the Devils, as they needed two runs to tie it. With some line drive hits, junior Reese McLean made the game 5-4. Then senior Hannah Bulos tied the game up 5-5. Now, during the extra innings, Melrose started off and quickly got on the board 6-5. Burlington was down, but they still had a chance during the bottom of the eighth. Burlington scored twice with a run by Reese McLean and Sophia Wojtek ended the game with a 7-6 victory. That was insane. Um, I knew we were going to hit that girl. We were hitting the, that pitcher all day long and they made some really nice plays on us. Just a matter of time before some dropped in. And then Sophia with the bomb to walk off. That was incredible. That was incredible. So great. Girls softball will face against Arlington Catholic on Wednesday, June 23rd at Marvin Field. As of this taping, the game is still to be played. Red Devil Wrestling had a home meet against Norwood in the District 2 Metro Sectionals on Monday, June 21st at Varsity Field. In the end, the Devils won the meet 46-33. In addition, the team was named the Metro Sectional Champs after the meet was over. Good luck to all of the graduated seniors who participated in Red Devil Athletics this year on your next chapter in September. For more Red Devil action, go to the B News Sports section at bcattv.org and check out our Twitter page at B News Sports. And that's all for your weekly sports report. I'm Liz Gillespie. Back to you guys in the studio. Since the taping of the sports report, the girls' softball team played in the quarterfinals of the MIAA tournament on Wednesday at Marvin Field. Burlington lost the game 12-9, unfortunately. Uh, we will have highlights in next week's sports reports. The Burlington Senior Center is preparing to reopen and offer in-person activities after almost a year and a half of being closed. For all the details, we go now to Council on Aging Director Marge McDonald with the latest senior news. Hello. It has been a wild ride the last 16 months, but the time is finally here to cautiously scale back up. We've already started with a couple of activities and we are all very excited to have most of our activities 
back up and running beginning July 6th. We are hopeful that the newsletter will get to everyone by July 6th with all the activities that we have for July and August. A few notables that won't be back to our new normal until September. Bingo will have to wait until September and Judy's class will stay virtual for now. The activities that are back in person and also remaining online are coffee hour, Sophia on Mondays and Fridays, painting on Mondays, Thursdays Mahjong and Tai Chi, coming back full on without being online are the Nitwits, meditation and Indian lunch, walking group, bridge and Scrabble. We will have one last grab and go, not including the farmer's market, a barbecue chicken lunch with coleslaw and potato salad. Please call to reserve your lunch. Pat Agostino from People Fit in Woburn was scheduled for June to talk about exercise and had to reschedule to July 14th. His presentation will be hybrid. You can come in for it or watch it on WebEx. If you would like to watch it from the comfort of your own home, email coa at burlington.org for the link. Please register for all activities to ensure we have enough room for anyone who wants to be able to socially distance. This is important to make sure everyone at least feels comfortable coming back. The last 16 months have been painful and difficult for everyone. Some have gotten through it better than others. I ask you to be kind, allow people to wear their masks without judgment, and if you would rather wear yours, know the Senior Center is a safe place to do so. We ask that you respect everyone's boundaries and give everyone a little more space than before COVID. I still look for my mask when I get up from my desk. More than a year of wearing a mask and social distancing has given us habits and a sense of safety that will take a long time to undo. It has been a long year plus with no one in the building that was meant to have a lot of people in it. We can't wait to see you all walk through our doors. I'm Marge McDonald, Director of the Council on Aging, and I hope to see you at the Senior Center. Another week, another photo to highlight. This week's photo is another image of nature. It was taken by Paul McNamee and shows a gray fox walking through his family's yard at dusk. Apparently this fox is a recent mom and has been seen with her two kits on a regular basis. Thanks for the photo, Paul. We'd like to see your photos. They could be of your spring activities, your family trip, or just every May, everyday moments, whatever you think is interesting and want to share. Email your photos to bcat at bcattv.org with the subject line photo of the week. Okay, that's it from the news desk here at B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher, along with B News Director Rich Hosford, Tad Stefanak, Robert Paris, John Vias, Marge McDonald, Gretchen Carey, and Liz Gillespie. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>